evening. Excessive drinking by students at Miami University is it's far from normal. More than 20 students went to the hospital for drinking too much. And it's really not unusual for 80 percent of all sexual assaults on campus were linked. Meanwhile, new president Dr. Gregory Crawford learned some disturbing news. So that's what happened this weekend. He implied that the students had learned nothing. The students have heard enough from the adults. They need to talk to each other. The student perspective saying, we're not going to do this anymore. And Mike, are we in for a repeat tonight or is everything under control? In the past year, there have been over 188 hospitalizations, with as many as 21 throughout one weekend. The number of liquor law violations increased 31% between 2013 and 2015. During the course of nine months, the deaths of two Miami students were linked to alcohol. And these are just the numbers. This is a typical Thursday night uptown in Oxford. Crowds of students make the trek up High Street to the bars to drink and socialize with friends, often to excess. People come out no matter what the weather is. There's a ritual to going uptown and going home, but the state students leave in is almost always the same. One person who studies the way students drink at Miami is Dr. Rosemary Ward. In many ways, her research shows the way we drink is different. She has found that 50% of Miami students have reported blacking out at least once in the past year. People often say blackout. I feel and they don't mean blackout. and they don't they mean don't know it. what blackouts mean. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess they, they don't mean alcohol induced amnesia. They do mean just partying really hard. I'll agree with you there. But people post all the time or talk about I'm going so I will not remember what I did. We have a unique situation with this generation, and Jean Twenge's work really touches on that in the book Generation Me, is that we have this idea where we have been doing this confidence movement where kids got participation, got medals for doing everything. So every aspect of their lives is celebrated and documented on Instagram and social media and filtered to look a certain way. And so no, nothing bad happens to me because all I ever display are the positive aspects of my life. And so you start believing nothing bad is going to happen to you. What's more prominent in the current generation than past generations is that coping mechanism is missing. That they've had parents or other adults sweep in, do the scheduling, do the arguing for them, whatever it is, and when nothing negative ever happened. I can't tell you how many students I sit down with and they're like, this is the first time I failed. And I'm not saying failing a class, they got a B plus. And the B plus was the new F for them. And they were just, they couldn't, they didn't know how to cope with that. And so we see these conflicting messages. Here you're in college, you're to celebrate. You are to have all the fun that you could possibly have because this is your time. And yet we haven't given you any kind of mechanism to deal with anything that might negative happen from that fun as well. Science-wise, it's you've had so much alcohol in your system that you're suppressing your hippocampus. And so your hippocampus is responsible for creating memories. And so whereas the rest of your brain is still intact and you're able to move around, have sex, drive cars, you know, murder someone, you store no memory of it. Outwardly, you're not showing any symptoms that you're blacked out. So it's impossible to look at somebody who's drinking and be like, they're blacking out. We don't know. It's actually up to the person to later on say, I don't remember. Now there are two types of blackouts. There's the fragmentary blackout and there's the on-block blackout. The fragmentary one is when what some people say they're browning out or graying out. So it's when you come in and out of consciousness. So you'll have some memories, but you don't have a complete memory of what you did. The on block is you don't remember anything you did. And the thing is, as a culture, we reinforce the fragmentary one, which is more common with movies like Hangover 1, Hangover 2, when anytime they we talk about people coming together after they drank and said, I remember what you did. Kaylee, what did you do? And oh, AJ, did you do this? And then you try to piece together the night through your blackouts. And so we've made it now part of a bonding experience to celebrate what happens after a blackout. 
The drinking culture plays out largely on social media, creating influential digital narratives. Miamians and young adults everywhere are often consumed by cultivating images on social media that are generally considered the best versions of themselves. student's office and I joke that it took me two days to realize that alcohol and drug abuse, particularly alcohol abuse, was sort of at the core of many of the other things that were being brought to my attention in this role. But then as I reflect back, it was actually probably only two hours that it took for me to figure it out. Uh, high risk consumption is an individual choice, ultimately. Absolutely, the decision to intentionally binge drink is an individual choice. So I'm, I'm falling back on my economics training here. So I think about how do we change behavior? Well, we have to increase the cost or we have to reduce the benefit of this activity in order to impact it. That the geography of Oxford is very detrimental to us, particularly in the following two ways. You walk one block off the slant walk, that iconic entryway or exit way to Miami University, however you want to think about it. And in one block, it just so happens, and there's nothing on the surface wrong with it. You happen to be at the corner of the two highest density undergraduate drinking establishments in the entire town. Now, if you take a bigger town, you take these locations and you put them eight blocks from each other, they seem much less consequential. But in the peculiar geography of Oxford, they're right across the street from each other. Austin Worrell is an ASG cabinet member who has been working on rewriting Miami policies related to student drinking. Dr. Kerm and I have worked a lot on how we needed to change the alcohol policy to reflect more of the cultural aspect of Miami. Uh, and so it's more of a partnership between policy and culture and not policy versus culture. What we would work on is changing the alcohol policy from 105A and 105B, which is currently intoxication and possession, to intoxication associated with adverse behavior with alcohol use, and then possession and consumption, which would be a major violation and a minor violation. The major violation would be hard liquor, and then the minor violation would be beer and wine. And the reason behind that is the culture that's here is one where a lot of students are going to drink no matter what the policy is. So if they feel that they might not get in as much trouble if they consume beer or wine, which is typically a less dangerous alcohol to consume, then hopefully we'll have more students choosing if they're going to break the rules to break them in a more safe manner. I just think that sometimes we're not necessarily aware of that, you know, oh hey, maybe I should look out for that person. I think sometimes we just assume, oh, they'll be okay. They've got it under control. Mm -hmm. Not because I think that I only care about myself, but because I just assume, oh, you know, they can handle their own situation. When sometimes the reality is, people don't. People make rash decisions and unfortunate circumstances happen. So if we can just be more aware of, hey, maybe they do need help. Maybe I should step in. Um, I think it's more of a others focused mentality of just being aware that sometimes you can be effective. When I was a student here, it was at Shillitoe's. It was a very nice store, so if you really wanted to get some nice clothes, uh, that was a place to go. Steve Gordon attended Miami in the early 70s, when beer was the only option in town. At the time, students weren't allowed to have cars, so the freedom to go elsewhere didn't alter their expectations of Oxford. Now we have uh, a basketball program featuring the Miami team from the spring of 1973, Coach Hedrick. And what's interesting in the program, as you see featured on the back very prominently, is a full page beer ad. So again, I think the, what they're promoting is the fact they're almost like a, not just a bar. You can actually get some pretty good food in there. I remember sometimes you just have what was called a Coke date. You know, late afternoon after class, and if you maybe were interested in connecting with friends, or if you had a young lady, maybe you were really interested in getting to know better, you say, hey, what do you say we go over to Tuffy's after, after classes today? Just have a Coke or something. Uh, so that was, that was something I did fairly often. 
when we were students, it was almost the norm for college students to drink, but not to excess. We didn't have, there was no conscious thing about this blackout. That's a whole new phenomenon for me. Uh, if guys had too much, you know, we just basically took them home or we just said, hey, you're not in good shape, we need to get you home. Uh, and it wasn't really good form to get a girl really drunk either. That was just not good at all. Uh, I would never do that to a date uh, because it just wasn't something you'd want to do to her and it reflected poorly on you, I think. So uh, that doesn't mean we didn't drink and have fun at, at events or parties. We certainly did, but I think we kind of had a sense of knowing what the limit was. And if guys went beyond that, you know, we'd kind of kind of talk to them about it. You know, say that's really not what you want to do. It's not cool. Until 1975, the only alcohol sold in Oxford was 3-2 beer, which the state ruled was non-intoxicating. Residents tried to legalize more potent drinks, but those initiatives failed until students were allowed to vote. At first, only carry-out liquor stores could sell everything. Then, in 1979, by the glass liquor sales were allowed on High Street. Today, obtaining alcohol is easy, and with the proliferation of fake IDs, the drinking age is less of an obstacle. We sat down with a member of Greek Life who was willing to discuss the initiative originally created by seven sororities to reduce high-risk drinking during rush. I mean, honestly, I find, like, a, my fun times is, like, going to the grocery store because, like, that's something I can do for myself that doesn't have to do with drinking and doesn't have to do with going to class. So it, I just think that because there's so few options, it's kind of hard to stray away from wanting to head up to the bars on a Thursday or Friday. So there were, I believe it was seven sororities that took the initiative to, I mean, everybody's heard of Blackout Monday, and it's, you know, a time where a lot of the new members find themselves in really uncomfortable drinking situations just based upon, like, they haven't drank in a while, they just got their you know, their bids, so they're with their new sororities, and, like, they don't know anybody, they want to fit in, so, like, that's why it's been perceived as blackout money, because girls are just, like, rushing to drink almost, and so this initiative this year was, like, I believe it was the first seven sororities that, like, Miami believed had the most effect and impact on campus, and they wanted to plan things that were non-alcoholic socials, they wanted to make sure that everybody had options, and they wanted to kind of, they said that they wanted to eliminate Blackout Monday, but in my opinion, it was more of just a pushback to, you know, Blackout Thursday. Honestly, I wasn't concerned about the number that happened this year. What I was concerned about is the number of people after that occurred that are afraid to want to go to the hospital because they don't want to be a part of that number. They don't want to increase the number that disappointed all of these professors and the administrators at our school. As much as we say, like, we love these girls, like, we're so glad you're in our sorority, we don't know you. We picked you based upon the, a couple conversations that we've had with you, and you picked us. But realistically, we don't know if you're a high-risk drinker when we meet you. And that's, I think, why, like, any other given night, if I were to go out with my friends, I know, like, so-and-so drinks a little too much, so-and-so has the tendency to like wander off on her own, I can be like, hey, you're coming in a cab with me, you, I'm watching your drinks, you know? Think about when you started at Miami, think about that Miami image. Mm -hmm. So we came in thinking you had to be Instagram perfect, all right? We also recruit certain students. We heavily recruit from the seas, you know, Columbus, Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland, Chicago, California, China, okay? So we get a certain type of student that tends to be one who's had a different life than maybe other schools. So that's part of our little Miami image. We get certain students here that come with a certain profile coming in who are very academically driven, so have, are used to high level stress. So they feel like they need to play hard too. That adds to it, plus the Greek culture, plus this whole idea of this is the time of your life. And when you add all of this together, and add into a place where we are known and constantly ranked as a party school, you, I mean, this is a recipe. There's a certain crowd that Miami attracts where I don't know if it's just like, whether it's money or whether it's 
just the fact that we're in such a secluded area that people sometimes don't fit in here and they don't know what to do with themselves, so they drink themselves into like oblivion. I don't know what it is, but if they were to at least improve the resources that they have for those kids that are either filling that void or are, you know, just lost on campus and feel like drinking is their only outlet, then maybe this wouldn't be such an issue. I was extremely shocked, if you will, to go to an ASG meeting last year when the ACC was put together <clears throat> to try to get the student input about the, what their view of the alcohol culture on campus was. And what I heard was a sizable percentage of that body expressing attitudes that were descriptive of denial of the, of the problem. When there was acknowledgement that there was a problem, it was minimized. And when there was a, a little bit further acknowledgement of the problem, the, the, the cause of the problem was externalized. Others were blamed for it. This is very typical of an alcohol culture, an alcoholic culture. I remember recently speaking with a student who said, you know, she had gone to Cincinnati with some friends and was drinking pretty much at the level she would be drinking here and that those friends were concerned. College students themselves were concerned. Why are you drinking so much? That's a lot. Are you okay? There is no sort of external influence to be able to say, no, 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 stop, right? Like the bar no owner who's going to say, you've had too much, right? Cut you off. Um, not to say that they don't do that here, but it's not happening enough. We know it. Um, so it's because it's within this bubble, because this community is so dependent on the students in that regard, um, the bar owners are dependent on that student cash, right? Um, they tend to sort of allow it in a way that it, I don't think it would be allowed in other cultures. And when you're talking about people outside the college system, they're not drinking to this capacity um, at this volume, at this, with this number of students or people. If there's one thing that any student could take away from what Dr. Hall and I are talking about right now, and there's a lot we hope they take away, but one yeah. thing, it is that to get blackout drunk is a very serious event. That is not something that is fun. It's not something that is cool. It is dangerous at many, many levels. And it contributes to a pattern of that leads to alcoholism and dependence. I don't think students are aware of that. They, they learn it in Alcohol EDU, you know, all these other places, but they're not really paying attention. People will learn. It takes courage to be sober. And once you start to see some students do it, it can become cool to do that. Just like it become cool, it's kind of cool now to help your friend who's got a mental health condition. Um, students are more aware of that now than they used to be and that's wonderful. They're not going to stand by when somebody's talking about they want to kill themselves. They're much more engaged in that. They need to be engaged in binge drinking in the exact same way. They need to confront their friends. Before we even come to college, we already have an idea of what it's supposed to be like when we go to frat parties or bars. We know what we want because we've already seen it on TV. Some want to be like Jay Gatsby, others want to be like Jordan Belfort. But what happens when the party's over? If you're going like, to build a relationship with alcohol, it's kind of like you're getting yourself into a bad marriage. At first, you're in the honeymoon phase and everything is amazing. You just go out four or five times a week and, you know, everything's great. You and your old buddy are, you know, just having a good old time. And then slowly, it'll start to creep up on you. And for me, that happened sophomore year. Like, I don't know, it's just everything starts to eventually lose its luster. You can never really attain the same, like, high almost that you got the first time when you just, you know, go uptown and while out. Oh, yeah, no, going into, going into my freshman year, like, I was, you know, set on being just, you know, Stifler, Van Wilder, or any of these movie stars that you see. Like, you just go in thinking, like, oh, I'm invincible. I can, you know, be the biggest partying animal that this college has ever seen. And, I don't know. I think that too many people take up that um, that mentality, and I mean that just feed everybody's feeding off of one another's excitement for drinking, and eventually it just <laughs> leads to everybody becoming alcoholics. I feel like I never was like, like totally against the idea of drinking, 
And it's something, that, honestly, I don't regret waiting for. It made my 21st birthday more fun. <laughs> Scott Lentz, a junior marketing and film studies double major, discussed his abstinence from alcohol until he turned 21. Instead of heading to the bars every weekend, Scott spends a lot of his free time with his friends and crew and performing comedy shows and sketched out. There's a tendency to go overboard, a tendency to, um, to get drunk uh, rather than just enjoy a beverage, you know? And so um, I would honestly say that culture here is a little bit dangerous, especially starting people off on some people, you know, move in weekend of their freshman year. You don't have to drink, and there's a lot to do in the surrounding area, if, even if there's not so much to do in Oxford. But there's still plenty to do just hanging out with some people um, at someone's house or in someone's dorm room, if that's where you are. Um, it's really about the people you surround yourself with. And if you and your friends decide that the only way you can have fun is to drink, um, whether you're 18 or 21, I feel like, like that's a problem. I think people have a real big tendency just to accept that drinking is going to happen in college. And rather than accept that and then continue to watch really dangerous things happen, especially, you know, um, in light of recent tragedies that have gone on here, even ignoring that and just seeing 20 plus students go to the hospital or people get arrested all the time, things like that, um, people expect that drinking is going to happen in college and that's the outcome. At, no matter where you are, people go to the hospital, people end up in the drunk tank. Um, and in unfortunate and rare situations, people die. And I'm really, to, to be blunt, sick and tired of watching people at my school accept that and then get mad at people who try to stop it. Um, people have a tendency to blame the Miami student or you know, blame people for being judgmental. When somebody dies and instead of trying to um, fix the situation, like they try to fix the situation and people want to sit back in the same old, same old, and they want to, you know, do what they do, and they don't want people to infringe upon that. And so even when somebody dies, they're unwilling to change. During Matt's sophomore year, he got involved with drugs and alcohol, so much so that his behavior became a running joke among friends. My friends started to call me Barvizu. I, my last name's Arvizu. I get called that a lot, and it was just it was too easy of a comparison to make. I, I like to joke around that I kind of have an alter ego. And Barvizu is that alter ego. Barvizu is everything I don't want to be, but it's what I am when I put too much alcohol in me. Basically, just unrestrained, talk to anybody. That aspect I do like about him. I think it's bad that people just like me uh, everywhere are coming up, they're, they're kind of having their own alter egos when they go uptown. I think it just adds to the facade of this place. Everybody goes uptown under false pretenses, comes out a different person, and I'm not going to lie, I was Barvizu for a long time. I, uh, yeah, I, I, would like to, I would like to say that Barvizu is a lot, better, like a lot worse than me. I like to put all of the bad things on him, but um, in a way, your drunk self is definitely still a reflection of you. There goes my city at work. <laughs> what time is it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine. Well, since I was just walking uptown at one thirty, I overheard a waitress say it's happy hour, and I thought one thirty, it's happy hour. I think it's happy weekend. Yeah, yeah. Who knows what that is? Like everybody's the worst. Everybody's. All colleges have drinking problems, and all colleges always have had drinking problems. It seems the severity and the the way in which drinking happens is has changed across campuses to one which seems to emphasize binge drinking, and so that's one of the things I'd characterize about Miami's drinking culture. People say, oh, well, Miami likes to have, or Oxford likes to have drinking here because we, the city makes all this money from the alcohol. So that's not necessarily true. That's not a simple truth. One of the things that happens on Saturday afternoon these days, on the weekends, well, and now the weekends are now sort of sometimes start on Wednesday, sometimes Thursday. The drink special situation has made the uptown area uh, pretty toxic for a lot of shoppers. And so a lot of the um, retail industry in the uptown area is declining because non-drinking students do not want to go uptown. Um, so it is not so simple as to say that the city makes money off of alcohol. Anyway, it, it, even if that were the case, it's not the city, it's maybe a few establishments that are. One of the things that people ask about routinely is, what are you doing about drink specials uptown? Plays right into this strategy of keeping the cost of alcohol high. 
Interestingly, in Oxford, Ohio, and for Miami University, this is something that is beyond our control other than the use of moral suasion with permit holders because the state of Ohio prohibits home rule. Home rule meaning local municipalities do not have the power to adjust the times that establishments are open, nor do they have the power to restrict drink specials. We hire extra police staff on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, so we're paying extra police officers for that and they are working 80, 90 percent of their job on those nights is dealing with student uh, drinking issues. So that's an issue of safety. It's more than anything, it's an issue of safety. If, some, if we have an, another police incident outside of town and they're not enough police because they're all locked up in a bar, that's, that's a problem. Um, the hospital has been facing a lot of strain recently because for good reason, really, oddly enough, there are all these students that are now going to the hospital when they get drunk. I mean, I think that's good because they've seen that one tragic case where someone did not go to the hospital. So now when people get drunk, their friends are sending them to the hospital. That's good, but the hospital is strained. They can only carry so many, you know, handle so many people. So they call in doctors on overtime and stuff. So that's hard. Also on EMS. So on city services in general. I mean, the other problem I also want to add is that the city is not just concerned about money and it's not just concerned about services but when kids die on in our city it's not like nobody wants that mm -hmm. and when kids are throwing up or bumping into people in the street or passed out in the street or pass out on a train track and get run over by train nobody likes that either so that's not what we want to be known for there, there's no silver bullet let's put it that way I don't think there's any one thing we can do to stop it it would have to they would basically have to be attacked from a lot of different angles. Um, you know, we have peaks and valleys with uh, with the alcohol calls. We usually have a uh, a large influx like we did this year at the end of rush. Um, usually, the first weekend or two of school is very busy, and usually the uh, the week or two before finals each semester is pretty busy. Um, and that seems to run pretty true every year. I, you know, we just had a young lady die from uh, basically an alcohol overdose, and that didn't seem to help it. You know, a week or two after, we have more people than we can haul um, calling, and that's only a, a small fraction of the people that are actually impaired that are, you know, walking around out there at night. Um, you know, I would have to think that for every Ten that we're picking up, there's probably 20 or 30 that are in just as bad a shape, but they made it home and made it to bed. Um, you know, there's really no telling how many people are teetering on the edge every weekend of, uh, of being in the same shape that she ended up in. Uh, and for sure, worrying about getting in trouble. Um, getting in trouble is not near as bad as getting dead. Binge drinking is dangerous. It causes mental health problems. It causes addiction. These are signs of addiction. Miami students have this belief that the alcohol patterns that they develop in college, once they graduate, they're not going to be bothered by it. Yeah. That's not true. That is a myth. We've been saying that for a long, long time. But what gets through to the alcoholic attitude? I don't know. While Miami students celebrated St. Patrick's Day for generations, Green Beer Day began in the late 1970s, when Miami's academic calendar change put March 17th in spring break. And while it tends to attract a lot of media attention, for high-risk drinkers, it's no different than any other weekend in Oxford. Every Wednesday, a group of students from the Individualized Study, or Western program, come together at Skippers to grab a beer and talk about life. 
These kids are one example of a more moderate group of college-age drinkers. It has a, it's it's not hard. the first one. Sure. Like, it's not like recklessness, but like, and it doesn't happen every week because this, like, this event happens every week. So the amount of like times that we actually get drunk, drunk, is pretty low compared to how often it happens. But like, you know, there'll be sometimes when everybody finishes, like. Because, I mean, we're all in the same classes, so, like, if you finish a paper, or, like, we had our big senior uh, proposals <laughs> last year, and after we finished them, everybody was like, we're going out, and we're going to drink a lot of beer, and it's going to be great. And the thing is, like, again, it's beer, so, like, the whole liquid ratio thing is, you know, you, it's not as bad as, like, taking shots. Like, those are the only times where, like, we're all just trying to, like, you know, celebrate something or whatever. Or, like, sometimes accidentally, like, we played Irish poker. <laughs> you should ask Jackie about this. And Jackie did not know how to play it at all. Uh, so, yeah, she got a little too drunk the first time we played that. But, you know, it's yeah. a learning curve. Um, like, I never go out for the sole purpose of getting drunk here. Like, I've never been like, oh, I'm gonna get hammered at Western Wednesday. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go here, and then sometimes I have like one too many beers. Because why would you not wanna remember what, like, if you're having so much fun, why do you wanna not remember it? <laughs> I, I'm so excited he's here. He, he was, so, uh, yeah, it's excited. I didn't put on the Matt Hurtado was one, so he told me she was like, like, like ah! Woo! Is this irresponsible? Party fell. Party fell. I can't associate with you anymore. My foolproof system of management is failing. 18,000 people go here, and not that many people have ever seen the inside of Brick Street. And there's people that are looking for the same opportunities. And really appreciate if you can make a first step towards being genuine or having a genuine conversation. And we talk about stupid stuff. I mean, I remember like my senior year last year when we were talking about like the merits of pop stars or like you know what's in between Taylor Swift and Jay-Z it's not always this like highly charged academic intellectual thing um, but there's never any pretense of like saying things for like social capital or saying things that you feel like you have to um, and that goes a long way because it feels like you're talking to a person like, yeah they're my friends they're, like there's no judgment there's never this like hidden like i can't believe they said that so for, for the first time i felt like i was able to like enjoy being myself with other people um, it's not it's not easy to, to to define that but once you do you got to make sure you like you invest the time into it cuz like you just sad. interact with him so, so much cuz you just have no I come from a town where we also don't have a movie theater. Uh, we have two bowling alleys and a roller rink, but no movie theater, if that tells you what era my town is from. Yeah. Um, so like coming here, I was like, wow, there's so much to do here, <laughs> you know? Even Cincinnati, there's nothing to do in Cincinnati. Like, if you're co using these standards, there's nothing to do anywhere. Yeah. It's not like, you know, you gotta, there's plenty to do here, you just have to find it. I truly think that stuff like this happens everywhere at Miami. I don't think that what we see at, on High Street is what the dominant culture is. I think that people do this, and this type of gathering um, is what people imagine when they talk about college drinking culture, college party culture. But it's not always visible here. It's such a small town, but the spaces that people have to to, to do this kind of thing are limited. Um, and that's why we've always gravitated to this place. We've always come here, and uh, it'll always be here. We get to share the space, and that was something that I feel like I can't do on a regular basis on a weekend. It's very difficult to come up here, even to the same establishment, two blocks over, one block over. You feel like you don't belong. Uh, but here, we feel like we have a space in high, on High Street, in what you know is like Oxford to a lot of people, and we get to inhabit the space, and that's that's cool um, because it's it's not just for people that are going to be loud and always drunk and it's a it's a nice downtown area and it's nice to be able to get to be seen doing something that's not 
what I would consider not destructive, what I would consider actually a, a productive thing for a lot of college students. There's a visibility aspect of being uptown here. And I think it happens, that's the thing, it happens everywhere. Whether it's in people's houses or apartments or basements, wherever it is, this kind of thing happens at Miami, but not everyone knows that it happens. So being seen, um, I think, is, is a good step forward in combating some dangerous elements of, of what we see uptown. Thank you for taking the time to watch our documentary. After two and a half months of reporting, I know there will still be many students on this campus who don't understand why the Miami student is still covering this issue. The reason we are putting such a great emphasis on trying to understand our drinking culture is because we believe there are far too many students who are willing to dismiss tragic incidents as isolated events, when in fact they undeniably reflect our culture. Counter to what Miami administration has repeatedly said, People our age rarely act individually. We're constantly influenced by our friends, and with social media, we're more connected than ever. With that, there's more of an opportunity to intervene. So if you see something wrong, online or in person, speak up. We can't keep waiting to have these conversations until after something tragic happens. And those conversations can't just happen in committee meetings or administrators' offices. They can be candid conversations between students, and we believe that those can happen. And when we really start being honest with one another and looking out for each other, then that's when students can shift the way that we think about drinking. <laughs>